call the meeting to order at 7.03. Just have a couple of announcements. Those attending tonight's meeting should be aware that the meeting is being audio and video recorded by APAC and ASRSD. Any audience members who wish to record any part of the meeting must inform the chair who will announce the recording. This is to comply with the mass wiretap statute. The listing of matters are those reasonably anticipated by the chair which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. Per the Air Shirley Regional School Committee policy, BEDH, public comment is, a discuss is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between citizens and the school committee. It is a citizen's opportunity to express an opinion on issues of school committee business as posted on the meeting agenda. Citizens will have three minutes to express their views. Can I have um, everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Shall we call the roll for us, please? Mr. Bradman, here. Mrs. Ranger, here. Mr. Quinty, here. Mrs. Reshoots, Mr. Rupert, here. She on Zoom? She's not on Zoom? Okay. If she happens to join, can you just let me know? Thank you. Okay, so next on our agenda is our high school representative, Ms. Ana Sanchez. Hello, Ana. <coughs> All right, so first thing I have to talk about today is college, of course. Um, I've received all of my applications back, and I've been accepted to all the schools I got into, uh, I applied for. Um, but I've narrowed it down to two decisions, so Bridgewater and Clark University. Um, it's difficult because they both gave me a lot of money. So <laughs> Bridgewater no gave me, yeah, um, they gave me a lot of money, so in the end I would have to pay like 14000 a year maybe. And then um, Clark originally gave me like 26000 a year which wasn't a lot compared to their um, tuition and stuff, but then they gave me a lot of grants. So in the end, I'd have to pay like the exact same amount of money. Um, but right now I'm leaning towards Clark because they do a free master's program, and that just sounds very appealing, you know. Um, uh, my second thing is that I'm actually working with Mr. Deppy to do dance classes at the elementary school or like dance classes, but just like a time that we can all come together and you know, learn some moves. Um, and then in my government class, we're working on doing our one minute speeches. So um, we all get to choose a topic and then we have to go in front of the class and do just like a one minute thing as if we're on the floor of the floor of Congress and stuff. And I chose to do mine on um, the importance of having diversified dance clothing within the dance community. Um, such as having um, plus size leotards, um, having tights and shoes that match all skin tones instead of just like the classic ballet pink and things like that. And then lastly, for my AP classes, we're starting to take our mock exams. Um, we had our lit one last Saturday, but the power went out so we couldn't see the time. <laughs> um, but after that, it was fine. So yeah, that's everything. Thanks, anyone have any questions? So I'm just curious, at our last meeting, yes. um, there was some student participation, and there was a, definitely a lot of discussion around the schedule changes. Oh, yeah. So just interested, what have you heard, anything recently, and kind of your opinion on what you might have heard? Yeah, um, with the waterfall change and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, my sister's a freshman, so she was like, I don't want that to change, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, she was like, it's going to be more homework. But um, from what I've heard from teachers and things, that it's, it's going to be the same thing anyway. It's just different schedule. Um, I, I mean, I'm leaving, but I'm not opposed to it. Um, doing the, the four blocks a day can be very tiresome. But um, I also like it a lot because I get to have more time with my teachers. But then again, you'd be having them every day, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. So essentially, it's the same thing. So, yeah. so I think the seniors have they kind of been left out of the discussion, not 
but yeah. just because you're not going to be impacted by yeah. it. So I'm sure maybe that's not spreading as much through your class as it might be through um, the younger grades. But yeah, I've heard from some of the juniors that um, they're upset that they might not have senior privileges, which is something. But then again, I, it doesn't really affect me. But yeah, I've definitely heard from it from my sister. So. So for the current schedule, have you had the current schedule for how for the entire time that you've been? Yeah. Um, how have you find the found the length of the classes? What is it, seventy nine mm -hmm. minutes? Um. Mm -hmm. Some classes are worse than others, depending on the topic. <laughs> um, I find that with time that's used wisely, it goes by like super fast. Um, especially in like my lit class, we find that there's no time at all because our brains are just constantly going in that class. But um, I do think that it can become a lot after the, the repetitiveness of it after a while. Um, I actually, I don't know if it's gonna be similar to like the middle school schedule, but I really liked having all my classes every single day. I thought it was kind of helpful, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is your class starting to talk about senior activities at all? Or? Yes. <laughs> I've heard talks about like Blue Sox games and everything. So that's exciting because if I end up going to Clark, I get like discount on tickets because yeah. it's a Worcester, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> I was going to say, you're two schools, and I'm not really familiar with Bridgewater, but one, Worcester is obviously more city. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have, you know. Yeah two different worlds there that you can pick from, which yeah. is kind of nice. Yeah, for sure. Whichever one appeals to you more. <laughs> yeah, um, I liked Bridgewater because I could bring my car my first year, but then my dance teacher told me, she was like, Anna, it's probably better that you don't have your car the first year, so you can actually make friends. <laughs> it's like, that sounds like a good idea. But, yeah. Yeah, the car gives you an easy escape. Mm -hmm. um, and do you know what you're going to major in? Um, it depends on the school because Bridgewater has a secondary education major. So if I went there, I would do secondary and um, I would double major in English. Um, but if I go to Clark, I'm going to major in English, minor in education, and then for my master's, do teaching. So you're going to be an English teacher? Yes. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm sure with Ms. Witt and Ms. Casso are yeah. probably yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. If you end up in Clark, it would be important to know that um, to go from the Clark pool to the Atkinson pool takes 49 minutes. So in case, like in my case, if your daughter tells you diving practice was at Clark, <laughs> you go to Clark and there was no one there, it takes 49 minutes to get that. I'm pretty sure you so keep that in mind. That's very useful information. And I'll restaurant that's like right in the parking lot. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thanks right. for coming tonight. Thank we always you. appreciate your updates. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to public participation. If anyone would like to speak, if you could come up to the podium and address the um, school committee with your name and the town that you live in. And just keep in mind, again, that we're limited to three minutes. Good evening. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Ashley Kennard. I live here in AIR. I have sent you guys a couple of emails and I had a really great conversation with Dr. Renda, but I'm just here to kind of follow up and um, go over a couple of concerns that I have. Um, so I'm here due to several concerns that I have um, at ACP at Page Hill Talk. Um, we've been going there as a family for three years now. And the changes that have occurred this year have caused us to look for alternate childcare. Um, we really don't want to leave the program, but the changes have made it um, difficult and it's not accommodating for our working family. I believe these concerns deserve a more in-depth discussion, but to summarize, uh, the changes have been made to the hours of operation, fees, vacation schedule and procedures. Um, it's also been a high staff turnover, along with a lot of families that have left the program pulling their kids out. Um, a lack of communication from the administration, and then just a general feeling of unhappiness um, among the staff, and then you know that trickles down and then to the students. Um, and this is a program that we were previously very happy with. Um, these are not just concerns that are shared from me, but shared by many other family members. And that's both at Page Hilltop and Laura White. Some of these parents have joined us here tonight. Uh, many sent emails, uh, letters of concern, 
and then others have asked me to just pass along that they share these same concerns that I have. Um, we do not feel the changes that have been made um, were made with considering the effect it has on the families and the staff there. Um, the changes were made to a successful self-sustaining childcare program and it feels like it was made by people who self-admittedly don't have first-hand knowledge of the program and how it was working. The families and the staff were not given any input on these decisions and the communication of the changes has been almost non-existent. Uh, all of this seems to be done in an effort to increase the preschool program at the school, um, which isn't an option for all of us to use. Um, and I just feel the goal should be to support a program that has been working for the past 20 years, um, that does accommodate working families who are on a budget, instead of forcing us into a program that would not work for us. Um, we love ACP, we just want to find a way to protect it, uh, protect the great things about it, uh, maintain the amazing teachers and staff, get back to the welcoming feeling that used to exist when you walked in the door with your kids or dragged them in the door, as some of you may be familiar with. Um, and we just want to get back to that, um, an affordable program that is for working families that you know have time frames and places to get to. Um, so there's a lot more details and concerns that I have, but in the interest of time, I just wanted to give you this overview. Um, if this is the future of ACP, um, if we have to wait week to week to know what the hours will be, or if they're going to be open on vacation, um, then we're going to have to look for alternate child care. Um, and I know that a lot of other families feel the same way. Um, just last year, we spent over $14,000 um, at ACP. It was worth every penny. I'm not complaining about the price, but if we're going to spend that much money, I'd at least like to have a conversation before the schedule is changed and these drastic changes are made. Um, there is a reason that people have chose ACP, that people choose the ACP preschool program, and we just want to get back to that. Um, I think it's time that we take a serious look at what's going on and hopefully we're able to improve it. So thank you so much for listening to my concerns and I look forward to future discussions about this. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming and expressing your concerns. Um, we as a board will we'll, um, be talking to the administration. I believe that there is a presentation coming up at a future school committee meeting. It's not on tonight's agenda, um, but we'll be happy February. February 15th to hear about the changes and what's happening at ACP. And I do want to just point out one thing. I don't, I know I do, you did send an email and I don't want you to take any lack of response from a school committee member as disinterest. We typically have a policy or a procedure that one of us will respond and one of us, re when one of us responds, the rest don't. So I don't want you to think that because you sent an email, you didn't get responses from all of us that we ignored you or didn't see your email. Um, we just have that because we can't have a forum on anything and we don't want to have one person saying something that another person, you know, um, that, that's just the policy. So I just wanted to relay that as well. I didn't want you to feel like anyone ignored you or, or wasn't hearing your concerns. Anyone else? I'm sorry before I move on. Okay, great. Thanks. We're going to move on to the consent agenda, which tonight includes the um, January 18th regular session meetings minutes for release, um, and then also a warrant memo, which um, just pulling it up. So the warrant memo is dated February 2nd, 2023. It has accounts payable warrant 1106. Uh, for $342,264.38. Payroll warrant 16, dated January 20th, 2022. 20, is that right? Should it say 2023? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for $976,124.37. And payroll warrant 16.1, dated January 20th, 2023, for $2,231.90. So I will um, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'd make a motion to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> Second. Any other um, discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, so we're going to move on to new business, which tonight is um, approval of grants awarded. Dr. Renda. Thank you. We have three grants to present to you tonight that we have been awarded, and we are looking uh, for the school committee to vote to uh, accept them. The first is breakfast, breakfast after the bell. We are awarded $7,370. This is a competitive state foundation grant, and the funds will be used to purchase four commercial Vitamax blenders, one for each school building, and two stainless steel workstations. We are also awarded a financial literacy grant of $15,000. It's a competitive state grant. These funds will be used to support the high school financial literacy curriculum, in addition to career financial fair to be conducted in the spring of 2023 in collaboration with the um, middle school and elementary schools. And finally, we were awarded a school nutrition equipment grant $2,215 for Paige Hilltop, $1,150 for Laura White, and $2,130 for the middle school. This is also a competitive state grant. It's federally funded. Funds will be used to purchase a Cambro Cold Buffet tabletop units for the middle school, Paige Hilltop, and LAW. Could you explain what breakfast after the bell is and what Vitamix commercial sure. blenders are used? Well, the, the Vitamix is, is that's going to be used to make smoothies. But the, the Breakfast After the Bell grant is a grant to serve breakfast to students after school has already started. Um, typically now, one of the things that we do is students come in and they will get breakfast as they come in off the bus and bring that to a classroom or eat it in the cafeteria or another spot. The after the bell is for students who might not eat before school. They will still have the option to get breakfast and eat that first thing in the morning. In the elementary schools, it would be during like morning meeting. Um, but in the middle, in the, the high schools, that would actually be during some, some class time. Um, noticing that two-thirds two of our grants are around food services, was that a particular focus for um, Mr. Mooney, or is it just like there happened to be? Um, there happened to be. Happened to be. Yeah, okay. the, these came out at, at, in a cluster, and they were all due around the same time. Yeah. Okay. And there was a lot of repetition. Yeah, uh, you can reuse. Yep. Yes. Totally. Yes. Great. All right. It's nice to see this. Um, next up is coming They are. Yeah, we actually got some information on on one today that we'll be sharing probably at the next school committee meeting. And um, they are they are coming in steadily now. Yeah. We send our thanks to Mr. Moody. Will do. All right. Um, so I will entertain a motion that we approve the um, or accept the 2022-2023 um, school year grants awarded as outlined in the memo dated tonight from Mr. Moody. Make a motion that we approve the grants outlined in the memo presented. I'll second. Seconded. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? All right. So those are approved. Thank you. Um, and now we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, thank you. Um, last week, uh, or late last week, uh, Mr. Plunkett, Mr. Bresnahan, uh, Mr. Rupert, and myself met with Mac Reed. He's a former. Uh, superintendent in Shirley, but he's currently working for Mars, um, and he is our consultant for the po uh, for the discussion of the population study for Aaron Shirley. Um, Mac will be attending the school committee meeting February fifteenth uh, in order to present on the population study and discuss the implications of the study. Um, it is, I, I will share that. Um, Mr. Reed had very kind things to say about members who are on the school committee when we regionalized. And I believe that was, there was three of you, if I'm not correct. Um, Mrs. Granger, Mr. Quinty, and Mrs. Uh, Rishitz um, had very nice things to say. Um, I'm gonna give you a little information about the statement of interest. Um, this did come up at the town, at the select board meeting um, earlier this evening, and I will be presenting um, the process of the statement of interest at the next school committee meeting, but just to give you a, a, a little background, uh, the Massachusetts School Building Authority has opened the 23, uh, 2023 statement of interest um, period for core programs. 
The deadline for submitting core programs is Friday, April 14th at 11.59 p.m. We will present at the next school committee meeting about the process and the school committee's responsibilities. Also, um, ACP restructuring for the 2023-24 school year. At the next school committee meeting, uh, Ms. Mary Beth Higgins, director of the Air Shirley Extended Day Enrichments Program, which is actually the name of the program now, uh, will present on the restructuring of ACP program, which will, which has already taken effect, um, but some of the final changes will take a place uh, for the 2023-24 school year. The program is largely remaining, remaining the same uh, with small changes in programming that will not affect current families. Uh, we plan to share all the information on the program um, and the changes with families prior to the school committee on February 15th. I, I'm, <clears throat> Dr. Renda, do you, in terms of some of the concerns that we've heard in the email, and <clears throat> just curious, is that something that will kind of highlight what some of the concerns we, we are? Can, if, absolutely. Um, one of the, for instance, one of the changes is the, uh, it, the program was closed during winter break this year. It's typically open. Um, this is a child care program, and if you look, most, if not all, child care programs usually shut down that week. Um, so having talked to, to Mrs. Higgins, we made the decision that we would, we would fall in line with that. Um, people running those programs need a break also. Just, we, we will highlight, yeah. Okay, that was what I was going to say. I, I'm not saying that we need to do it now, but it might be good. It, yes, As you're presenting sorry. on the 15th, we... We will go over some of those changes. That was really the major change. Um, there was a change in some of our... 90-minute uh, early release, um, but the, the program has re mostly remained unchanged this year. Probably more changes in the extended day program over at in Shirley, which is now part um, of, of this program. Yeah. Right. We do have some college acceptances uh, that were submitted. Um, I think it's been a while since we read these, so instead of reading the new ones, I think I'll go through all of the college acceptances at that it's okay with the school committee. Um, we have Bates College, Bridgewater State University, Endicott College, Pittsburgh State University, Framingham State University, Franklin Pierce University, LaSalle University, Merrimont, Manhattan College, Merrimack College, Plymouth State University, Purchase College, Regis College, Roger Williams University, St. Anselm's College, St. Michael's College, Salem State University, Salve Regina University, Suffolk University, the New Schools College of Performing Arts, University of Massachusetts Amherst, University of Massachusetts Boston, University of Massachusetts Lowell, University of New England, University of New Haven, University of Rhode Island, University of Southern Maine, Westfield State University, and Worcester State University. And the sports update was submitted by Steve Kendall, uh, so he wishes to share congratulations to the boys and girls track teams, both of which uh, won the Midland Wachusett League Championships last Friday night. The team will compete at the Central Mass Championships at Fitchburg High School on Saturday morning, February 10th. That's this Saturday. Senior Brian Holmes became just the sixth player in school history to score 1,000 points in basketball, knocking down a free throw in the second quarter of Friday night's win over Bromfield. Girls basketball team has already clinched the state tournament berth after wins over Lunenburg and Bromfield last week. Carly Iwa had a goal and two assists to lead the girls' co-op hockey teams to a 4-1 win over East Bridgewater. The team clinched its first state playoff berth in years, improving to 10-3-1 on the season. Boys hockey has won two consecutive games and still has a chance at reaching the postseason. Cheer will be competing at a competition in West Boylston. And both middle school basketball teams have had outstanding seasons and will wrap up with games on Tuesday and Thursday of this week. Both teams are at home starting at 3.30 p.m. I will add to the sports update that we lost two fiberglass panels in the gym Friday night. <laughs> I was about to say, do we want to talk about that? Here? Yeah. Wins and then we won. Uh, it was a very windy night, very cold night. Two of the panels blew out onto the roof of the high school. Um, Mr. Plunkett and Mr. Briggs really facilitated the work of getting that boarded up through Boarded Up Boston, which is, I believe, a company that either the fire department or, or um, police department recommended. They are able to board that up uh, sometime on Saturday. It took most of the day. We are currently awaiting an engineer to come in and look at the panels that are still standing and the, board, uh, the boarding up job to see if um, we can get an all clear 
to use the gym. As of right now, the gym cannot be used until we have a um, clearance from an engineer. So a lot of the games are being rerouted to the middle school. Um, of course you can though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is there any time frame, expected time frame, or anything about when? We thought there was a possibility that it, that engineer might come today. We're hoping tomorrow. Um, but that is the best information that I have right now. If Mr. Plunkett is on the line, he might have he might have more. He's been dealing with the insurance company on that. Uh, yeah, I saw an email uh, from the engine there. He's coming out Friday. And so, Friday. so yeah. this engineer is just inspecting the boarding up that's been done, done now. And if that's approved, we could continue. Or does there have to be replacement? I believe panels? he is checking the not only the boarding up but the existing panels to see if they are structurally sound and of not in danger of falling in. Correct. Now, just a curiosity question. Is that something that is um, like the building inspector imposing? Like who, whose rule is it that this has to be inspected before we can use it as I believe it is. Is that the building inspector uh, bill or is that the insurance company? The building inspector will not sign off uh, on occupancy until we have an engineer uh, come out and weigh in on this. Okay. I figured it had to have something to do with, with that, but just want to make sure. And this is something that insurance covers, will cover? We think, uh, so. We, we think so. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we think and hope so. Okay. Start passing the hat. Mm -hmm. And start passing the hat. Yeah, right. Anyone else have any questions about the superintendent's report? Well, just adding to it, the um, oh, swim. With the Bromfield swim and dive team, which Darren was a captain of, Catherine was a captain of, and Sierra is a captain of this year, won the league championship at Tantasco last week. Just, I mean, it's a it's a big step. There are 17 teams in that league, like Tewksbury, Groton, Dunstable, things where I mean, there are some big teams in there, and it's a the um, overall win for Brownfield, the girls won first and the boys are, I think, ended up in fifth. But an overall win for Brownfield. And they start uh, the sectionals. Uh, the girls placed two relay teams and eight swimmers in the sectionals, which will be a Super Bowl Sunday at 7 a.m. starting in Springfield. And then the state tournament is two weeks from then, which will be at the MIT facility. Thank you for, for letting us know. I apologize for missing out. Is, the, um, is that sectional, the one that's in Springfield, is that what used to be at BU? No, that's a, the state tournament was at BU last year, that MIT this year. Okay. The college acceptances, um, how do those get updated? Just because I know. Students submit to the Mrs. Guidance. Wallace and the, the, the school counseling department. So the students need to, so, okay. We'll feel free to do it if your student's not going to. <laughs> we'll, we'll take them from any family member. Okay. <laughs> We'd like to add to that list. We I have guess. a few in yeah, my family that say, will add to this list, yeah. Every year you, uh, feel free to, to shout out your acceptances to me. Um, yeah, there are additional from Fairfield University that should be on here, Bryant College, um, and uh, Sacred Heart. Or will be added soon. All right. Get those acceptances. Yeah, three well. great additions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Anyone else before we move on? All right. So we're going to move on to um, item nine, which is ongoing business. It's the fiscal year 24 preliminary budget update and discussion. Dr. Rednap and Mr. Muskett. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to start with our draft. District vision, as we did last time, that is to create a dynamic, engaged learning community that provides equitable access and opportunity for all members and empowers students to achieve at high levels by fostering intellectual rigor, creative expression, social emotional well being, and the agency to pursue meaningful, meaningful paths and thrive as responsible citizens. Tonight's presentation will include the fiscal year 24 budget, the assessments, and any questions that you may have. In November and December, we conducted needs assessments with all departments 
on January 3rd and 18th, there was a budget discussion held with the Regional School Committee. On January 18th, the fiscal year 24 preliminary budget was presented to the Regional School Committee. We currently are, are awaiting um, the new governor's um, budget. We expect to have that the first week of March. On February 6th, last night, we presented the preliminary budget to the Select Board and Finance Committee in Shirley. Earlier this evening at 6 o'clock, we presented the preliminary budget to the Air Select Board and Finance Committee. At the next school committee meeting, we will present the fiscal year final budget presentation and public hearing at 6.30. On March 7th, the Regional School Committee will hopefully certify the fiscal year 24 budget. On April 24th will be the AIR annual town meeting. We will give a presentation if needed, but we'll be there to answer questions if not. And on May 9th, uh, we will be at the Sh Air, uh, Shirley annual town meeting with a presentation if necessary or to answer any questions that they may have. Next, we're gonna talk about the district student enrollments. For fiscal year 23, there are 1,636 students. That's an additional 14 students since last year. The total um, ASRD, ASRD population, including out of district students, is 1669. The high school currently has 394 students. That's an additional 26. Over last year, Air Shirley Regional Middle School has 367. That's down 20, 23 students from last year. Laura A. White has 343. That is an additional 19 students. That is a, that should not be a negative. Um, my apologies. And Paige, Paige Hilltop is at 532. Um, it is down eight students since last year. Next, we're gonna look at the choice out and the choice in. Currently for fiscal year 21, where there's 121 students who are choicing out of Air Shirley uh, Public Schools. That's 69 students in Air and 52 students in Shirley. That is an additional 11 students from, from last year. Currently for the fiscal year 23, of 97 students choicing in. And though that is uh, an all-time low, it's important to note that we had 35 students over the summer um, provide choice in applications. 31 of those applications were denied because we had closed school choice for grade levels based on the academic and social emotional mental health need of our students. That is something that we will look at, uh, we will ask the regional school committee to look at in May and June to possibly reopen. Um, all indications are that that was a good choice. Um, our internal academic data is, is trending higher, considerably higher than it was last year. Um, so it's not that we don't want school choice in, we wanted to make sure that we were able to meet the needs of our students coming off of that pandemic. Um, so that number 97 isn't because there is a lack of desire to choice in, that number is at 97 because the school committee made the choice to close school choice in and keep class sizes low, especially in early elementary grades. Uh, next, we're gonna take a look at the students who attend charter in Ashoba Tech. There are currently 33 students in AIR who attend a charter school. That is typically going to be Parker, but there are some students who attend Sizer in Fitchburg. That's actually one less than last year. There are 31 students in Shirley who attend charter schools. That's uh, six additional. And there are a total 64 students um, who live in AIR Shirley who attend a charter school. Uh, Really, there's not much of a difference in the trend. That's an additional five from last year, but that was at an all-time high, um, excuse me, the five-year high, not the all-time high, uh, in fiscal year 18 at 71, um, and we are currently at, um, at 64. Uh, Neshoba Tech is really a, a similar story. There are 70 students in air uh, for fiscal year 23. That's actually nine additional from the previous year. Uh, Shirley had 41 students but that's eight less from the previous year. So we had one additional student. So in fiscal year 23, there was 111 students that attended tech. Uh, the year prior, there was 110. We are ranging from 99 to 111 over the past uh, five years. And then our English language learners. The state has, for fiscal year 23, 12.1% of the entire state was English language learners. 
compared to our district at 4.3% or 71 total students. The high school has eight students or 2% of its population um, uh, being an English language learner. The middle school has nine students or 2.5% of their population. Laura White has 18 or 5.2% and Paige Shelltop has 36 or 6.8%. You're gonna see the biggest difference here on fiscal year 22 to 23 being Laura White went from three to 18. And that is because we made the decision to have both elementary schools service English language learners. Before this, we were busing students from Laura White into Page Hilltop. We had noticed some of our surrounding communities were audited by the Department of Ed and the recommendation was made to have English language learners attend in their home school. Um, we decided to be proactive and make that um, decision and choice uh, last year. We did offer the students who were at Page the opportunity to stay if they wanted to because Page had become their community. Um, and there were, I believe, two students who, who chose to stay, but the majority of students did want to return and, and go to Laura White, their home school. Uh, next, uh, our special education enrollments. In fiscal year 23, we had a total enrollment of 1,669. Of that, 290 students are in special education in ASRSD. There's an additional 33 students in special education in out of district for a total of 323 students. That's 19.4% of our population. We're actually down um, over a percentage point from last year. Uh, however, we are exactly at the state average of 19.4%. And the percentage of our special education students uh, that are in out of district placements as compared to our total population is 10.2, excuse me, as compared to our total number of special education students is 10.2. And the percentage of our special education students in out of district placements as compared to our entire enrollment is 2%. Next, I want to talk about our, the special education out of district costs. In fiscal year 23, the cost of placements ranged from $38,496 to $327, not to $327,961. Projected for fiscal year 24, that goes to 41, <clears throat> excuse me, $41,191 to $350,000. 918. The total cost for fiscal year 23 was $3,001,412 or 8.9% of our budget. Uh, the projected cost for next year is $3,201,530 or 9% of our total budget. It is important to note that the OSD approved a 14% increase to day placement and residential schools. And that's where you're seeing that, that big increase. Okay, this is where I take over. Good evening, everyone, again. This is, uh, I'm not gonna go through every line um, again this time because we uh, we did have uh, the budget presentation on the 18th and we had have made some changes, some updates, uh, and some cuts to the preliminary budget. So on the drivers, uh, the tough section of revenue, general fund revenue, we've added $50,000 uh, an additional revenue uh, to transportation reimbursement and to Medicaid. Um, so uh, we are short from the prior year, $95,260. Uh, in the middle section, the budget drivers, the cost uh, centers, uh, we made cuts uh, of 461,000 uh, health insurance. We went from 7% to 6%. Um, Charter and Choice Out, we had originally plugged in the initial or the preliminary FY23 numbers. We know those are gonna change uh, when DESE reviews the uh, rosters at the end of the year. Uh, so we hope that uh, those numbers will, will come down uh, a little bit. Uh, we've also reduced the increases to regular transportation and sped transportation um, for that total of 461,000 in reductions. And in the bottom section, uh, we have added uh, to the circuit breaker fund, 
uh, 189,000. Uh, so we can utilize a full reimbursement next year for that OSD increase to our private residential and, and day out of district tuitions. Uh, so we increase that budget uh, for circuit breaker to $975,109. So those were the updates to the drivers and projections. Uh, the next slide, the revenues. Um, again, uh, these are a select rep general fund and a couple of revolving fund revenues. And I believe uh, these stay pretty constant, except for the medic increases to Medicaid uh, and the reimbursement from the regional for transportation. Uh, so this slide is basically the same. Uh, we're about five thousand dollars off of the revenue for these selected funds over the prior version of the budget on January 18th. Moving on to the history of the regional budget, uh, our general fund is down $814,000 from the prior version. That's a 2.6% increase over FY23. Uh, looking down, the next change is for all funds, uh, which came in at $35,200,274. Uh, that is down from the prior version uh, $525,000, and that's a 3.3% increase over the prior year. All the other figures following that row are the same. So we'll move on to the assessments. And the assessment, the operating assessment, which just does not include debt, uh, has come in at with these reductions and increases in revenues. The assessment has come down to $20,983,013. That's an $864,000 decrease from the prior assessment from January, the version we had on January 18th. And again, it's a $580,000 increase, 2.8% increase over the prior year. No changes to foundation enrollment. Stay the same. Capital debt, no changes. And the big changes to the assessments. Okay, so uh, the total operating assessment is coming in at tw Lost your bill. Uh, uh, that's a five hundred and eighty thousand dollar increase over the prior year. Mr. Two point eight percent increase. Mr. Plunkett. The prior version, that percentage was you can you hear me, Bill? Without debt is twelve million six hundred twenty four thousand four hundred and eighteen dollars, which is an increase of $380,222, a 3.1% increase over the prior year. The prior version of the FY24 budget, we that was 6.9% to air, and that's we made a reduction of 3.8% on the operating budget for air. And the operating assessment for Shirley has come in at $8,358,595. That's a increase of $200,569, 2.5% increase. Prior version was 7.4%, and that's a decrease of 4.9% uh, for the Shirley operating assessment. And we skip down to the operating uh, assessment and debt together. Um, the total of those two, the assessment total is $22,677,395. That's an increase of $892,444 over the prior year, a 4.1% increase. The prior version budget had this as a 6.1% increase, so that's a 2% reduction in the, in the uh, increase for the total operating assessment in debt. Total operating and debt assessment to, to air is $13,610,844. That's the total increase of 477,498 over the prior year, which is a 3.6% increase 
prior version of the budget had that as a 7.1% increase. So that's a reduction of 3.5%. And finally, the Shirley total operating assessment and debt comes in at $9,066,551. That's an increase of $414,946, a 4.8% increase over the prior year. And the prior version, version of the budget had this as a 9.5% increase. So the Shirley's total operating assessment and debt includes a full effect of the field projects um, debt being included in this FY24 budget. AIR has uh, elected to use funds from the CPA to lower their amount. That's why the percentages are, are lower for AIR after adding the debt. And they, that will be phased in over two years. Uh, so they will feel, they'll see a percentage increase in FY26, uh, showing them feeling the full effects of that field project debt. So that's where we are currently. I think we made some, um, some cuts that uh, are pretty conservative and we make, we move some uh, of our positions into the grant, some of the um, special ed paraprofessionals uh, to the, uh, to the grants. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, the health insurance, and the cuts to transportation and uh, the sped, uh, sped circuit breaker uh, was a key piece uh, of getting that the, those uh, percentages down. And any questions? Anybody questions? So Almost. moving some of that some of the uh, positions into the grant money, you know, some of those grants start to time out. How does that affect us in future years on uh, budget building? Bill, do you want, do you want to take that? Do you want um, to- uh, Yeah, I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat the question? Moving some of the positions into grants, how does that affect us in future years with budget building? Well, we try to move people that we know who are uh, <laughs> retiring um and that has worked out pretty well we we did identify a couple folks that are going to be retiring we have uh one piece it one position uh actually two that were one-on-one -on -one, uh paraprofessionals that work is exclusively with one student one was medical one was vision so as they graduate now those positions um can be moved to fill other open positions in the district because we're, we always have movement and uh, we have input from the department heads that if they're a good employee, we want to keep them. We will move those folks into these open positions and then we'd we'll be able to take them out of the grant uh, and back into the general fund. So we're constantly trying to prioritize and move back positions right. uh, when, when appropriate. I will say you guys really scrubbed these numbers. I was surprised to see what you came down to when you went to the, to the town. So I missed the Plunkett's MVP. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a lot of work from, from a lot of people, but uh, Bill was the, the main driver of that, figuring how to bring that assessment down for, for both towns. How did the presentations go to the boards? I think well. Um, you know, it's, uh, we'll know better at town meeting, um, but we think, uh, we think they went well. There, there didn't seem to be, there were really no questions um, yesterday and Shirley, correct? And there were a couple clarifying questions tonight in air, but nothing, um, nothing uh, major about the budget, uh, more about statements of interest, which we'll talk about in more in depth at the next school, uh, school committee meeting. I think the only Shirley question had to do with certification of E&D. And we handled that. Yes, and we'll, E&D. We'll just wait on that and we'll see how that impacts everything. Yeah. And the governor's budget comes in, and then we'll see it again in you know a couple of weeks. Yeah, know a lot more. That is correct. I think she's got to what March first. The first week of March. Come up with yeah, this. I think I might have said March first in one of the prior <coughs> school committee meetings, but I, I I guess that windows the entire first week. Okay. Yeah, we're hoping we're hoping it's earlier, um, but we're not counting on it. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
anyone else questions before we move on? Okay, so we're gonna move on. Thank you, um, Dr. Renda and Mr. Plunkett for all this work. Um, moving on to item 10, which is policy review report. Um, I'm gonna defer to you, Chris, on what's going on here. Well, we've got three sections. They are, well, one short, the other two are not. Um, we have February and March to, I think, get any feedback that we want um, to any feedback from the committee that we want to revisit with Dorothy. Um, so we can start with E, um, see how far we get with E. Um, I will note that section E because there's so much that we need to engage with facilities here. There's, I think there's still some where there's open questions about like, is this the policy? Is this what we do? Um, but if folks have had a chance to go through, we can go through. Um, if we haven't, I can voice over the top page or the, for example, section E, there's three pages that summarize um, the recommendations from MASK. How do folks want to spend their time? <laughs> I'll be honest and say that I have You You haven't committed these to? Well, where I have, I mean, it's all, <clears throat> it's not complete Greek to me, but some summary or narrative would, I think, help me as well. Um, great. So uh, I can start with section E. Um, so this is the policy analysis. Um, I think the general guidance from oh, what just happened um, from Mask was there are some the majority of places um, where they had feedback was more about is this a policy that's followed? For example, we have an asbestos management policy. That is something that um, Mask does not have, and they didn't have other examples. Um, of those handy, we should, the recommendation was keep it in place, make sure you still do this. If you wanna get rid of it because it's not, asbestos isn't a concern in any of your buildings, feel free to delete that. Um, there are some, what I'll call like nitpicky things that are dated. So for example, under first aid, it says contact a school physician. Um, they would recommend that we take from their policy where they say um, contact medical personnel because you might call, you know, the nurse, you might call an ambulance, um, not necessarily the physician. Um, there are also some things, so like the no school announcement um, policy, um, there's a few others that um, like bus behavior. Um, that should be in the um, handbook versus in a policy. So those are the um, sort of biggest themes across the recommendations that were, um, that were given. Um, the sort of last, sorry, the last big thing is around meals. Um, so we have not updated our meals in, I don't think, a few. I should look at the dates on them. MASC has more extensive policies around meals. They recommended that we adopt theirs. Okay. Did they provide, I mean, I'm sorry. Sorry. If, we were to, if I were to scroll through. So I'm if you scroll, at. yeah, if you scroll through, what is in here? Sorry, my computer just went into um, go to sleep mode. Um, so if you scroll, oh, are there's not in here. I'm sorry, you only see the Air Shirley version, don't you? Yeah, okay. okay. So after that, we probably shouldn't go through E because you can't see the marked up version. Right. <laughs> oh, because you probably don't have it either, do you? All right. 
I can follow up with Dorothy. Okay. So that's a summary of what's in there. Um, we will get a marked up version that um, we can look at. Or at least provides the mask policy that they're. Yeah, exactly, where they're making the recommendation of what yeah. we should right. um, look at. Um, great. After all that, do we want to go to section F? <laughs> Um, You're saying these sheets are not the updated ones? Because I think my packet has both. Um, I have both. Do you have, have the, both in yours? I have the Shirley and I have the MASC. For E? For, for E. Yeah, I have both. Um, <coughs> you. Are they back-to-back, -back, Jim, or are they, like, how, how is it? They're right next to each other. They're all the way through, just like they were for the, for the, for the um, Oh, maybe they are in here, but they're not labeled? Oh, so they are in here. Um, the bottom, so the footer is not going to help you. Um, you'll need to look at the file name. So for example, if you are, um, I'll make this easy. The first policy, policy EB, safety program, the first page of that is the Air Shirley version. Right. The second EB in your packet is the mask version. Okay. Um, so they are back to back, um, but you'll need to scan closely make sense of it. Um, Where's Michelle? It's where it says source at the bottom of the policy, you might see like the legal references and the date where the policy was approved or changed. Or mm -hmm. You'll see source, uh, Air Shirley or source, MASC. Okay. Yes, Great. I see that now. Yeah. I made the mistake of scrolling to one that was two pages and didn't see and bottom saw that it said Air Shirley and that was confusing. Um, okay, so I guess Jim, I know that you've got some questions yeah. or comments. Well, I, have, I mean, I have a lot of, I went through it just like the last time and it went fairly quick with point specific questions, but I think where other people had had the opportunity to, to review, they probably want to look at it before I start saying what I like and what I don't like. Okay. <laughs> but it moved along, I thought, very quickly last time once everybody had a chance to see yeah. what was in front of them. But clearly they didn't have a chance to see the MASC policy for comparison. So yeah. I think it will be moved for me to go through this at this point. Okay. Um. I do think, Jim, it might be helpful if you provide your comments to Chris, at least to that. I mean, it depends on how many there are, but if there's a lot. Well, they were, they were um, I think they had, they gave their review on what they were thinking about when they were doing it. Then they just took a look at what they put in front of me and they said, all right, this is just a minor change here. This is, yeah. you know, some of it's wording, some of it's a line, some of it's a paragraph, some I like ours better than theirs, some I like theirs better than ours. So it's nothing earth shattering, but I think if we are, we're all starting on the same page, it'll go, we, quicker because then we'll be able to like look at the changes and then vote it up or down and just move to the next one. Mm -hmm. The vote goes and that's the way it goes. I mean, so. I don't know that I would necessarily deviate much from the recommendations of MASK, so I'm okay if you want to do yeah. that or if you want to take time for everyone to be able to review them, that's fine. Too. Kevin, would you prefer we next week go through and give you a week to read. Otherwise, I'm happy to take notes on your comments, Jim, um, and make sure that we can, just so we don't have to do, a, you know, if we can do one policy, a meeting, it keeps us moving and not spending hours on it. I mean, I think if we could do some of it tonight, just because we had somewhat of a shorter agenda, and then next week, it sounds like there's a couple of things that 
Mm -hmm. It's stacked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'd great. rather do some of it. Perfect. Great. At least, at least if Jim could provide, you know, like the voiceover or like yeah. questions are great, and then if there isn't I general just don't consensus, want to put too much on for next week because agreed. Yeah, that works for me. Right. <laughs> great. Um, EV safety program. Um, I actually like the the. Uh, MASC, it's, they're exactly the same as that we have a paragraph at the bottom, but in the bottom paragraph it says, you know, we have to follow the instructions in the order in which they are listed. Okay, we, but, and then there's no way to know what prices that you're going to have to cover. Yeah. Whether it's going to be hurricane, tornado, whatever's going on. So I think there's no way to do the last paragraph. Yeah. So I think right. the MASC policy is clear because if you get in a crisis situation, you're just going to be relying on the people that are in control to be good on their feet. Great. Then we get into um, uh, pest management program. Um, I was okay with ours, and except in the first paragraph, it says that our. Uh, IPM will be on file with the state. Now, I don't know where you would file that, or who is supposed to get that. Because there's no, there's no reference to where that would go. That was one of the questions that we have to follow up with the facilities team. Okay. Um, then I get to uh, EBAB, and says in there that we have to have three year re-inspections and we probably would have to, after the inspection, have a, a list of exposure locations somewhere. This is the asbestos one? Yeah. E -B -A -B -A. Um, yeah, I have many questions about that one. Yeah. I was like, do we have asbestos in the district? Um, and if so, yeah, it would be helpful to... And, the, and we have to, so the, you know, we have to have a three-year re-inspection. I don't yeah. know where we put that file for the money that we mm -hmm. actually do that. Two, two um, of the four schools. Okay. And there is a, an asbestos binder in the schools that have that. Right. That tells us, those reports, it tells us everything that's hot in the building. Got it. Um, EBB first aid. Um, I kind of wanted to keep the the mass version. In our version, we have a, an extra paragraph that has no young child will ill or injured will be sent home, or an older child unless the illness or injury is minor. And I have no way to tell who a young child and who an older child is. So yes. I think we're just better off without that. I think the person on the ground looks at the kid and says, they're going to be okay or they're not going to be okay. But mm -hmm. I think that paragraph is no good. So outside of that, it's exactly the same as the MSC. So I think we should just keep that. Yeah. Uh, use of automatic defibrillators. Um, the only change I had in there was with ours. Um, we had the, the um, in the second paragraph, has the school district physician to monitor the program. I, I think probably our, our nurse is in a better position. I, I don't know how, how involved the, the school district physician is on a day-to-day -day basis. Not very. Right. So I think if we, if we are going to have something where we're going to have people, a certain amount of people trained and stuff, we're in a better position to control that than them because they have other things to do when they're not going to be thinking about us. So it'll be easier for, for uh, Renee to do it than it will be to ask the, the school physician to do it. Mm -hmm. What's over there? Sorry, donuts. To um, EBC, I think I, I think that for emergency plans, I think you need some flexibility. There is really laid out a lot of stuff with annual reviews and, and specific things 
protocols that had to happen mm -hmm. that I don't think we could reasonably expect anybody to stay on top of. There are lists that have to be maintained. The strings, there's all sorts of things that have to happen. And I think it's, I think if it's on the page, it's not, eventually it's just not gonna happen. You know, in ours, emergency plans, like figure out what things you are important for us and we have to plan for, and you can plan for it the way that you want and it meets the requirement. Right. And then the uh, no school announcement policy, E, B, C, D, R, we just jump that thing, we don't do that. It surely no longer blows their horn. No one lives close enough to hear. I love nothing more than reading that policy. That's um, awesome. What's that? What is the 333 three, three Apparently, uh, the, Jim, you probably know this. What's that? How did, Charlie wants to know what the 333 three, three thing this was. Is a, the fire whistle used to blow. This is the ongoing <laughs> thing. It was a battle for the longest time. The mm. fire whistle would blow um, also at 6 o'clock at night. Mm. And at noon. I feel like like our town, like I grew up in Westford, I feel like we did that too. It was like some horn that blew. When right. Yeah. Right. And at school park because with but the pain. I don't remember that happening when there was no school. God, I feel old. So there yeah, were people yeah, arguing all the time that, you know, they shouldn't be blowing it. There's no point to this anymore. But it was, you know, they're firemen. So it's about tradition. It's not that it has to make sense. It's that what we've always done right. until a really cantankerous woman moved on to Haskell Street, which was right next to the fire station. And she had a newborn, and she oh. went over there. You know, the kid was colicky, it was crying, it just went to bed, and then it was six o'clock. Like, nobody has a clock, they have to hear the fire whistle thing go off. So she went over there and blew them out of the water, and the next week, no more fire whistle. <laughs> We're all set. Good with that. <laughs> all right. Um, the... EBCFA, Airborne Virus Protection. Um, ours is better. Theirs only deals with COVID. Yeah. You know? And uh, the only change I made um, in ours was I added under the first one, because we, we, we put in it specifically that the Air Shirley Regional School Committee is the sole determinant of the initiation, suspension, or amendment to the policy. Mm -hmm. Right? But we didn't, one thing we, as oversight, we didn't, this is going to be in the policy manual. But we didn't put it anywhere in here that's going to say, are we doing this now? We're not doing this now. We're not. So I just added a sentence that said, the superintendent's office will record uh, this will record whether this policy is an active or inactive status. So if anybody had a question whether you had, it will be evident if people are worried around masks. But that's the only thing just to clarify. So if somebody picked up the policy manual and said, you know. I'm, living to your policy, so, well, the superintendent, you go to his office and said, well, the school committee voted on this day to suspend the policy, so it's an act of That's all. That's all. Building and ground security. ECA, um, there was uh, nothing in on, on the um, uh, propping of doors open, which I know is like a colossal no-no in today's age, and I couldn't find that anywhere here. So I thought that probably needed to be thrown into there. Um, yeah, that's a good question, and I'm trying to Pretty much sure everybody's instructed to that. But John, yeah. what do you know about that? Yeah, that's um, Mr. Quincy. I'm sorry, I was actually looking at the security cameras in school policy because we're looking to, to put that in. So if you could repeat that question, I'd be happy to tell you what I know about ECA. It. We have the same policy as mask, but neither mention anything about door propping. Um, so I'm going to go to ECA. I'm well, assuming that's in scary. the handbook, but we also...
So are you proposing that you would add something that says door propping? I mean, I'm just wondering. Door, door propping is a, is a big no-no. Right, yes. but. Right, so it's, I think it should be somewhere in, we should just add something into the policy. I didn't see it in the policy here. We, one thing we would everybody actually knows like everybody does, but. Yeah. We would I like that in the policy. Door yeah. propping is a huge problem. Yeah. No matter how often we remind people, it happens. Right. We're actually just submitted a grant um, for $50,000 for the two elementary schools in the middle schools to update update the middle school key card system and add a key card system right. yeah. so that teachers or whoever else right. don't have a desire to prop doors. Right. Um, so it, to have it in the policy would be extremely helpful to right. us. I think it's probably implied in the third paragraph, access to school buildings and grounds outside regular hours, or I guess no. Um, second paragraph, thank you. Um, yeah, the, it's a secure maintenance of a secure locked building. Um, the, the only but like, I was, but I th yeah, yeah, was saying that is because it doesn't. It doesn't seem to me that it gets that specific. Like I get what you're saying, yeah. but there's no, you know. It doesn't. This is very general, as as far as I read it. Right. It's, you know, windows or what? I mean, there's other things that could be kind of left open or whatever right. um, that this doesn't. Yeah, it, it, just, it just came into my after okay. that whole Evaldi thing. But yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't. The thing is, it specifies how access that access should be maintained or monitored for outside of school hours. It feels like there should be something that references more explicitly. Um, yeah, I don't know. I could see it being something that we call out more explicitly with in the second paragraph. We we do try to limit any yeah. work going on during the day, but but some if you have a plumbing emergency, that's when they can come. Yeah, that's when they can come to get back to the door propping in the, in the yeah. connection with the key. If we have a key card system, we could actually give a temporary key card to a contractor so they can get in and out. They wouldn't have a need to prop the door. If they don't return the key card, we simply inactivate the key card right. with a key. If someone walks off with a key, we're stuck, right? We need to call a locksmith. We need to have locks lock changed. So it, it is um, propping propping doors is an issue. I mean, it, uh, if you remember Fox Twenty Five, three, four, five years ago, Charlie, mm -hmm. you, I know you're going to remember this. They were r driving to random schools and trying to Opening just open doors. doors. Right. Um, Great. Yeah, I hope I just not Good. plant that idea yeah, yeah. for that to happen Seriously, again. Seriously, let's do an all staff uh, email tomorrow. Let's make sure our doors are locked. We, it is it is something that is, is people are reminded regularly. Now, it's not it's not really a problem at the high school. Um, teachers have key cards, um, so hopefully we'll have key cards at all the schools soon, so that it will bring down the need to do that. But it's not just our employees. We can give these key cards to to contracted workers, and then the important thing is we can turn that off at any time if it's not returned. So it, it is just a much safer system um, than what we currently have. And when you have a keyed system like we do at Page, you're gonna find prop doors. It's there, you know, no matter how many times we tell people, we do remind people often, someone always props the door. It's the, the, the rationale is just for a minute. I'm just grabbing something from the outside. Um, and often people forget that a door is propped. And I've found them propped open. Charlie, I'm sure you have found them propped open in this. Mm -hmm. Not that just by having it in the policy will make everyone stop, but it's it's I, I think it's a it's a nice addition. All right. You can tell I don't like prop doors. I see that. Yeah. I was on a fan of them either. Yeah. In high schools, they were particularly challenging. Yeah. PTSD is going on over there. It, it's, well, we're form, former principals dealing with yeah. prop doors. Yeah. Uh, then we get down to let's see, ECAC vandalism. I think we just get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Vandal, that's our crime. You treat it like a crime and do what you have to do or some other. Business. I just think we don't need an independent policy for vandalism. Um, for security cameras in school, the only question I had was. Um, what we wanted to do for length of retention. You know, those kind of videos get used 
in all sorts of places. It says that we have to retain them, but there, there were no time limits, and, and I think we should figure out. Now, data storage isn't as bad as it used to be. You don't have to worry about you know VHS tapes, piles of them, and stuff around. But I don't know. Um, especially in today's you know litigious world with where all sorts of activities can happen and they'll be looking for background information or whatever that they have. So I, and I don't even know what a good standard would be. If it's right. three months, I, I have no idea. We, we should say something, but I don't know what that one thing is. So we can think about that. That's a great question. I, it's a good question. I'll also note this is one that um, Dr. Rendell, you and your team may want to look at specifically about the like, the, <laughs> This is one that Joyce and I went in circles around for about 40 minutes <laughs> about the who has access to what video when and what the procedure is to access that. So it's worth, uh, like, if you haven't looked at it closely, this is one maybe um, think about ultimately, like, I came to the, like, superintendent should be managing that. You shouldn't just be handing them out, but, like, you can, um, yeah. That, that may be answered, I'm not positive of this, I'll have to look at the MOU that we have currently with the Air Police Department. Yeah. Um, that might be handled in there because there are cameras in the high school. Okay. Um, but I, I, I don't know offhand, yeah. uh, but that is a, that's a great point. We're, we're going to need uh, a, a procedure and that should probably be in, in the policy. Yeah. Well, even thinking about like who, if you are out, like who, just making sure that we are. Right. Or like, if you're in this building and something happens at law and, you know, police department shows up, hey, can we see the cameras? You know, does Beth Lewis give them access? Do they need to call you thinking right. through that situation? So um, I know that was one that had some healthy debate. Mm -hmm. well. <laughs> then we get to uh, EDC, which is the, uh, Loaning school department equipment and property. I, I just read it both and I thought ours was even though it was a little bit more explicit, in it, but it seems it was short and simple. And I thought we would just keep ours over there. So just my my opinion of my read. Recycling waste reduction, that's good. Um, we get to uh, student transportation services. On all the stuff with that and the buses, um, I got into really the uh, how we want to handle now that we have our little band. How much of this stuff is now going to apply? Because before, when we were talking about buses, we had all the protections of contract with the bus, but now some of that goes away, and you absorb some of the responsibilities. Um, And sorry, is this EEAC? Uh, EEAC. EEA. Um, interestingly, this is one where we match almost identically with mask. Um, and we were good till we got a, our own bus. And we just have to figure out whether our, our bus applies to these or not. Yeah, that's a great question. But you guys can think about that yeah. as you're reading. Think, I mean, because I, think, I, yeah. I thought about it a long time, and I'm not really clear what to do. So I mean, I think the distinguishing factor is the, that the yeah. bus doesn't, or the van, as far as I know, doesn't transport students to and from school. Or does it? Like it would transport kids to sporting activities or a field trip or something right. like that. Right. Um, I mean, there should be something governing the use of that. Um, but really, I think number three is probably the uh, biggest concern. Um, but as long as it is driven by a school employee, then they're going to be quarry checked. Uh, so we, that we may, wouldn't be an we issue. May want to, one, one way of dealing with this simpler, I thought, might be that if we make a decision that stuff, we're talking about student transportation with that 
met to and from school or with contracted busing. And then we have to come up with our new thing for the internal bus. So I thought that would really simplify things. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. That. Well, and I don't know if this gets that. If you look at, again, Mask and Air Shirley are very similar. Um, but Mask, for example, references bus contractors, 70 contractors, and school districts. So implying that like we would be one of the possible operators. Um, are responsible for the safe operation of school buses. Yeah, that's true. Um, and um, <coughs> I know that it's generally referenced as like getting to and from school, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in that order. You might be going from and back to school, right? Like in the event of a sporting event, you're providing transportation from the school and back to the school. Um, so I think that van would fall under this with the assumption that we adopted the, the, mask. the mask version, which is similar. Now, one thing it doesn't have is, it's funny, it looks really similar. Um, it's got the same number of bullets, but for example, we have Corey checks. Um, they don't, they just reference qualifications and examinations of bus drivers. Um, I would assume with D, we have a requirement for quarry checks um, for bus drivers. I don't know. Um, maybe we don't. I'll, I will. I will double check, but I, I can't imagine that there isn't. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to tell you that there. Absolutely yeah. Yeah. No. Is, that would. So that would be a question. Uh, but if we, um, that, again, there's a few subtle changes. If we wanted to adopt the mask version, that would probably cover the van. Um, yeah. better the thing that we would want to look at is making sure understanding what our contract with D has in terms of quarry checks and would add that in I wonder if it's a D requirement like an employee like yeah that's what I mean yeah, if it's um, well they're alone with children and, and typically anyone spending time alone unsupervised with a child needs a quarry check yeah. So I, I would think that they are, but we will find out for sure. We, yeah. we'll, we'll put that in the superintendent's report. Yeah, assume that's in the, um, in the contract, and that's one of their requirements, in which case it's sort of covered, but we may want to spell out explicitly in our policy. Um, OK. Walkers and riders. I, I was looking at that, and I just put a note said Adam. <laughs> so I said, "Do you want this Adam?" So I don't care if we have it or not. But I mean, I sit here. It, ultimately, it says it gives some general guidelines, and then it says that you can do what you want. So if that's really, if we can do what we want, then we can just sort of like get rid of it and. It seems to happen anyway, so I'm, I'm more like the less stuff you have, the better off you are. We, we kind of figure out who's going to take the bus and who's not going to take the bus without giving any guidelines and stuff. Yeah. And if there's a problem, we just sort of work it out. So I'd rather not have a piece of paper that says these are the guidelines that you'll have to override. Yeah. And just call the shot the way you see it. We don't have a policy now in our... So, so, so this is this would be additional. Yeah. Um, well, there's an MGL that we have to follow. There's Mass General Law, right. so which is which is anyway. this, right? Right. Yeah. So I mean, we're, we're following this now. In being right. a regional district, right. we offer transportation yeah. to anyone who lives in Aaron Shirley. Yeah. So I mean, there are there are students who live across the street from Page. Like literally, if they cross the street, they're on Page Hilltop property. They take the bus. Right. Um, that's one of the first questions that I ask, but it's it's you know the kid likes to take the bus. It's fine. Yeah, so okay. anyone who wants to take the bus can, um, and and we we do we do comply with Mass General Law. So it, it well, living in a town the size of there, most people are probably within that 
radius that we wouldn't yeah. have to provide transportation. Yeah, it was just, it was interesting. I saw the kid got on the bus, <coughs> drove about 30, 30 seconds to school and got off the bus. It's great. Um, so leave it out or add it in. I don't, I mean, I don't, it's, if you I don't mean, have one now and we're, I don't know, I probably would agree with Jim, like why have something? Yeah, I think I that, mean, we have to follow the law anyway. Um, we have to follow the law. I think the one, if we wanted to, um, Well, wow. are you saying for a regional school district, you are required to provide transportation for every student? Mm -hmm. All right, Regardless so this, of distance. So this wouldn't even apply This wouldn't even matter us. That explains why we don't have this policy. Mm -hmm. Great. We should not include it. There you go. Can I give you a live update? The bus has confirmed that they require fingerprinting and quarry checks for all employees. Tremendous. We can add that and adopt mask. Yep. Like it's us to EEAC, school bus scheduling or outings. Anything, anything informative in that, we should just get rid of it. It says that you're going to have to schedule school routes and do as good as you can to get all the students to the schools. We probably don't need a policy that tells you to do that. No. Um, yeah, that is a uniquely, that is a Air Shirley only policy, so. Well, one year it must not have gotten done. So we get to EEAE, School Bus Safety Program. Um, it says, oh, it just got that whole, you probably can't even say anymore. We, remember the fire drills you do when you were in high school? Well, all your friends were in the car, stop, stop at the light and run out of stuff. Well, apparently we're supposed to do that twice a year with we do. bus trips. You roll through that. And then they help you jump out the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happens twice a year. The kids love it. <laughs> I would love it. Yeah. <laughs> does, does what day is that? Can we be there for that? Do you do that? Do we do that on site here? We do it on site. Do it on site. Yep. Okay. Yep. And when they get dropped off in the morning, and, and we have to remind adults not to help the kids. Mm -hmm. But typically, two of the the older kids, if you're in the elementary school, will help the younger kids jump off. It's it, it's it's actually great to see. But they're they're helping each other get off the bus, and the kids are. Very excited about it. Not so much at the middle and high school, but yeah. in elementary school, they love it. Um, the one piece of feedback on that um, one from masks was, um, oh gosh, what was it? They reference, what is this, EEAC? EEAE. AE. Um, so we, where is this? Um, oh, number six, parents of kindergarten youngsters are asked to meet their children at the bus stop each day. Um, it was felt that that might be better suited for a handbook than a policy. Um, oh, I was looking at the mask. Misspelled kindergartner? Yeah. A helpful hint that a more crowded stop this can sometimes present difficulty. Thank you for uh, yeah. letting us know that. So we might want to pull that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Um, that's a jail. That's a I'm sorry, are you asking to pull six where the parent to meet the kids at the bus? Um, that might yes. be an MGL. But there are going to be probably a lot of concerns about dropping off a five-year-old without someone at the bus stop for them. Yeah, if you look at the next page, okay. the second two, so our five and six are not required by MGL. Those are ones that are um, unique to us. 
Five and six. Five and six. So parents encouraged to meet the bus driver. Parents of kindergarten, kindergarten youngsters, um, are ones that we authored and are not requirements, at least according to our mask consultant. For some reason, I feel like though any elementary school student, if a parent is not at home, I think it's five-year-olds only. And then say someone uh, 18 or old, it doesn't have to be a parent, 18 or older, yeah. typically. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, we, we can we look we'll, it up. We'll if research we, yeah. that. I, I thought that was MGL. I, I, could, I mean, I'm not a lawyer um, by any means, but um, and Mask is saying that's not required. They were saying, yeah. Or is that the one that you wrote? said was reference in the handbook. Um, they said that that was not required. So again, like the school bus safety program, number five, parents encouraged to meet the bus driver. Number six, um, parents of kindergartners are asked to meet the children to stop every day. Were um, unique to the Air Shirley version. They're, so you can put them in the handbook. Yeah, the response was, the first additional paragraph may be appropriate to conclude, however, the last one looks better suited for an elementary student handbook. Okay. Um, yeah, I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with the encouraging parents to be meeting the bus, but maybe not in the policy, maybe like. Unless it's required, because I, I mean, I remember being told that I needed to meet the bus for my kindergartner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I would want a parent, uh, you know, I would want that as, from a liability standpoint. You yeah. Would want yeah. What, what happens now if there isn't an adult at the stop, at times the driver will make some other stops and sometimes circle back to see if the parent is there. Um, otherwise, they, they return to the school. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, having, it, it was, it, it's a great policy and the biggest pain of a policy oh, as I'm far sure. as uh, uh, being an elementary principal. But at least we know the five-year-old is with, and even if they're at school. Um, so let me let I'll, I'll I'll do some research too and, and find out. We could keep it, right? We could right. Like the reality policy. is, like just because it's a not a law doesn't mean we don't make it a policy. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking that five year old whose parents there every day, and then for some reason isn't, and, and they get off the bus, handbook. and everybody leaves, uh, and they're petrified, right? And, and and I've dealt with that in the past too, um, where the bus driver mistakenly let let the five year old off, and I'm I'm speeding to a bus stop. As the building principal, because there's there's that young child. So, let let me look into it more. Um, I I it would I would sleep better at night knowing we have that in our policy. Then we should keep it in our policy. Okay. No one. I mean, yeah, we, I would ch probably change some of that language. Put it there, yeah, we, we can right. certainly clean it up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know that you need to specify it to parents. Like it can be an adult, you know, but like, uh, it should sibling, be a familiar, a yeah. familiar adult or a familiar. Or the word youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Then EEAEA bus driver examination and training in EEAEA 1 drug and alcohol testing for school bus and commercial vehicle drivers. All the stuff in there is required if you have a CDL license. And the people from D have to manage random drug and alcohol testing. There's no reason. For us to have either one of these policies, they can't. They can't get a license if they're not doing that. And you can't operate that way, so we don't need to do anything like that. Um, yeah, and that was. They're saying that the for E E A E A that the mask policy just recaps the requirement. The adoption is at our discretion. Yeah. For dash one, it was a similar piece of feedback, and it just adds. It provides for the district, oh gosh, this language is, um, it gives the district procedures to have in place in the event of a positive result. Um, but D would be the first one to get the positive result and they, they have to take their immediate action. Right, that would be my assumption as well that D is managing. Um, yeah. um, where is it? If we don't employ any of the bus drivers, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, we can although insist that the yeah, WebD do something right. if they're yeah, not. They're they, not they, have, they have to, definitely have to, they have to, have to sit. When they do the drug and alcohol testing, if you fail, 
then D has to talk to the person because they're in a consortium with where they do the random testing. They have to meet with the director of the consortium before they can turn back on. So there's a, a whole protocol for that stuff. Yeah. So, and their CDL yeah, gets immediately so, suspended with the virus test. So they can't drive. Yeah, I mean. And then they can, they can get back to citizenship driving once they work with the person from the, the, uh, the testing agency to prove that they're, that they're okay I, now, but then their testing frequency goes that up. All these other I rules. Just, I still don't know why we would have to strike it. It, it does yeah. say that it's in there too, so that's our expectation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't have this policy now. It's just a question, do we want to add this policy? Um, it's extra paper. It's maybe a safeguard, although again, like D is managing it. It's not on us to manage. I think if we were managing a transportation department within our district, if we weren't contracting it out, it would be, you'd obviously, it'd be essential. Um, it may be less essential for Air Shirley. So here, even like for bus driver examination training, each driver will file with school officials a medical certificate and proof of freedom from tuberculosis. So every bus driver is going to have to give that to us. Where is that? Uh, is that a e different policy? E okay. I am fine leaving these out unless there's a excitement about adding them. Or even just, I don't even need excitement, even just. <laughs> You're talking the E, E, A, E, A, and B? E, E, A, E, A, and B. E E A E A dash one. Right. That, that's fine with me. I don't even know what that is, but that's okay. Yeah. So we got uh, E E A E C student contact for school buses. That was I'm okay with ours. There really was not much difference between the two, so it's probably just be fine. Uh, let's see. Get to E E A E C dash R, and I changed on the first sentence. Uh, in case of any misconduct on the bus, the incident will re be reported in writing. So that would just mean that if, you know a bus driver comes in and they're PO'd about something that happened on the bus, they're going to have to write it down because somebody's going to have to try to recreate what happened. Yeah, but. I'm not, I don't think we need a proper form as long as they, you know, they write down whatever happens, okay. And at that stage, if there's a problem on a bus with a discipline issue, I think them and the principal can handle it. And on the first occurrence, I don't think they need to give the superintendent a copy. So we just, I just yeah. struck that with a copy to the superintendent. You know, if you get to two or three times, then it's going to come up to your ladder. But on the first time through, you kind of let the principal handle whatever's happening there. Um, one note about this policy. One, it's unique to Air Shirley. There aren't others that have this. This is handled in most handbooks. Um, it's also in Section J. So we have multiple. Which one is this? I'm sorry. Student conduct on school buses, EEA. E C dash R. Um, and so this details what um, will happen if there's misconduct on the bus, how students will get on and off the bus, disturbances that are prohibited. Um, so I think there's both a question of like, do we want this policy? Do we want it in this section or section J, which I can't remember what section J is. J is student. It's student conduct. It's just students. Um, or student, yeah, students. Um, or, and if we want to keep it in this or section J, do we want to make changes to it? Um. <clears throat> just initially, I would say if it's going to be anywhere, it should be J. I agree. Yeah, um, yeah totally. But I, I'm not making a judgment on it. 
let's kick the can to section J. We can decide when we get to J, what there we, we want to do with it. If we ever get to J, we'll go to that. That's good. Okay. Uh, brings us to EEAG, student transportation and private vehicles. Um, I don't think any of this really happened. I was just going to say that. Does this even happen? No. 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 I mean, Darren filled our minivan to go to swim practice every day, and Sierra fills the minivan to go to swim practice every day, and probably the same thing happens with hockey, right? Who, who can drive and who can carry who? Um. I mean, I just know even, like, that's why I was reading this, and I'm, I'm assuming that this is referring to sport act, like sports practices and stuff, correct? Because even, like, say when the baseball team didn't have a field here and they were all going down to Laura White, they were driving in private vehicles, and I'm sure... I mean, that's why I like the fact that we have this van now, because that always made me uncomfortable to have the kids caravanning like that, unless parents... consenting to their kids riding with other students. It's just dangerous. But. Yeah, I mean. I mean, I don't know how you really get around it, right? But I think it happens, and I don't think any of this happens. Yeah, I don't think any, well, I don't. I don't have a high school. I don't know what happens here. I remember what happened when I was in high school. <laughs> you piled in the minivan. Yeah, yeah. um, there was less seatbelts. Um, the one, I mean, I guess this is a question, like how often, or not even how often, are there examples where, um, you know, transportation's happening to and from the school by staff or parents outside of the van that's like organized, right? Like, is there an event where it's like, we're going to the robotics tournament and we're organizing this carpool? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. All the time. And yep. Yep. In, the, in those cases, are we doing anything in turn, like, Again, this is specifying the amount of liability, personal liability insurance the person has. Um, Mask recommends that we should say that any of those drivers or any other adults in the car are Corey checked. Um, I I'm think a, with robotics that happens because they're all tours. Right, I'm sure they're doing that for robotics, but I don't. This is not happening. But, yeah. Uh, the typical liability on a on a car for a high school is probably twenty thousand dollars. That's a minimum of the state, I believe. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we would check that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know how we would police any of this. Well, we have to, the swim sectionals in Springfield. They have to be there for seven. So Sierra is going to meet the Air Shirley, yeah. Littleton, Harvard kids at Dunkin' Donuts at five ten, cool. and there's going to be eight girls going to Springfield. So right. Driving. We'll see her driving. I think the diff like this policy is in the event of like. Is the coach organizing that or the kid? Like, again, there's a difference between me and my neighbor. Both, both have. But that, that's, that's not an excuse, though. That's just like, that's like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, whether the coach organizes it or not, the coach knows those kids are getting there somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's right. burying your head in the sand. Well, so. right, but the liability of it, right? So from a liability perspective, if the school is organizing or has transportation to and from activities. And I don't know, it, it does feel like there's a difference between like parents are responsible for getting their you know kids to an event and the parents organize a carpool. Feels different than we're going to this event, there aren't buses available, so we're going to use, you know, you know, these two drive these this teacher, this volunteer and this parent are gonna like drive all the kids. We we certainly wouldn't organize help organize a carpool of student drivers. Right. We we might inform parents that that transportation is not available and mm -hmm. we would need the parents to drive their 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 right. child there. If something happens after that, right that would not be from our recommendation. 
Yeah, exactly. So I think like that, again, is a different circumstance. You're telling parents they need to organize transportation to and from. That puts the liability on those families to get their children to and from, whether they're taking public transportation, an Uber, or you know, riding with their neighbors. Um, I think this is purely in the place of the school saying, we don't have a school bus, and we are going to like, you know, have Mr. Christie drive five kids. So I would say I, we would have probably, to take I would talk to some of the other schools that like, uh, say, Brownfield's the, the host school for the swim dive team, yeah. right, with us a little bit. So this affects us a little bit because, well, also affects Brownfield because they don't have transportation to the pool. Right. Right, so I think we should talk that pretty much anybody involved in, anyone involved in a co-op is gonna see this. Like the Harvard Brownfield kids coming out here to football practice, they're driving, you know. So I would, I would I sort of reach out and figure out, you know, happy we, we know it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Do we wanna e either get involved or sit there and say, or let kids and parents know that if your kid is involved in a co-op program, we do not provide transportation to practices yeah. for this sort of stuff. So it's up to you to make sure that your kid is safe. Something has to happen when you sure. sign up for a co-op because that's when this all happens. Right, and I, was, yeah. I would add to that, like, um, it's really the host school that's bearing the brunt of the responsibility in right. this because if anything were to happen on the swim ride, which I'm not throwing any bad karma out there, but or whatever, anywhere, right. it's the host school that's gonna. So if we're ever hosting as a co-op, we and we do for for football. Then I think and, that to uh, Jim's point, it needs to be made clear to members of the other towns well, that if there's no transportation no. provided, right, it's, you yeah. know, it, it can't be on air surely, but because. Who's the, who's the parent going to blame first? I can reach out to Linda and see if she knows more about this. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be an and easy conversation to have. Just as a note, like, this is our current policy. One, two, and three. Four is the, and Mask is saying, like, your policy matches what we have, except for we recommend schools adopt the additional Corey check. Mm -hmm. um, so we were the ones who initially wanted to have, or, I don't know if we got it from someplace else, but they're like, oh yeah, this is totally normal to require, you know, at least $100,000 worth of. Yeah, I'm not so sure. So That's probably right. close to I mean, what would that, I mean, insurance the, the for a 17 The associated with this have nothing right? to do with what the bigger problems are. Yeah. yeah. Right, so the, the um, insurance coverage is not really the issue. So I, I would just say, Almost all the schools now are hosting some co-op, right? Yeah. Proliferation. I would talk. You got your little superintendents network thing. I, I, we do. Right. So can you yeah. reach out to them? And say, look, this is everybody e -E knows. What do you got? This is not happening. I can get that on Why the list. How do you want to deal with this? Probably later tonight, actually. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it ha it happens even though even in a non-co-op situation. When yeah. I'm thinking oh, yeah. about like the Always. scenario Does. where we might be sending kids to Peroni to practice, mm -hmm. and, right. and they're piling right. into right. the, the bus doesn't classroom. show up for golf. Right. All that. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. You just go. Busing is is still an issue. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bigger issue last year as the field was 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 unavailable. So we had we had in baseball we had baseball in Leominster. We had it at Peroni. We had, I mean, we had spring sports all over the place. So yeah, I mean, and a lot of that, a lot of this happened. So yeah, you know, we can we can certainly look into that. Yeah. Um, do we want to adopt the policy on motor vehicle idling on school grounds, which we do not have? There are some legal references. Um, that um, mask recommended we consider. So this is EEAJ. I wanted to add a line that said the assistant superintendent should monitor all idling <laughs> all idling vehicles be great. throughout yeah. the winter. It, it's it, I understand what they're doing. I understand why they're doing it, and it's seen. No one is going to be the idling police. I mean, it would just be another piece of paper in here. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you know, people have remote starts, so their cars are warm when they get in. Yeah. You know, you know that's going to happen. I mean, 
And if you're sitting in the car for a while because you're cold at the football game, you're going to go back there, you're going to turn the car on, you're going to turn the heat on. So I, I don't think there's any way for us to comply to this. What is idling? I'm sorry, but like sitting there with your car on? Um, yeah, yes. Right. Car not to exceed you're just not moving. three just like, minutes in a 15 minute period or. That's like the, the pickup line. I mean, right. when pair and pickup, right. it's gonna, you're going to be in line longer than three minutes. Right. Um, acceptable, that is allowed. Yeah. Um, right, so like you can, you can drop your kids off, you can wait to pick your kids up. Um, but what you can't do is, you know, pull up to the school for half an hour in the middle of the day and just like sit in that turnaround in front of Laura White. Um, um, with those extreme cases, we can address that um, without a policy. Yeah. Um, yeah, would there it be are, like a fire lane or something like that? Or? Well, well, yes, but any, any, un, uh, any visitor to a school that is just, um, just hanging, out. The park, hanging out in the parking lot is a security concern. We, yeah. we would ask them to right. leave. Um, there's other issues with, with parents who have multiple kids and some infants. Um, and it could be winter, it could be like Friday, and you want to leave your car running as you're getting or either picking up or dropping off your other child after a doctor's appointment. Um, you know, I don't know if we want to tell moms, we don't want to tell moms with infants that their kid's going to be cold, right? Just like we don't want to wake them up with the fire whistle. Um, but we can, we can police the severe cases of this. Yeah. And in fact, I think if you ask the building principals, there, is there anybody that does this, they could probably, if there is, they could name who those parents are. And, it, and it probably already have addressed it. But it's, it's just a different world. Cars almost are coming, like, like you said, with remote start, right? And, and you're going to have a car idling and no one's sitting in it. Okay. And I think those go for 15 minutes before they shut off. Uh, depends sense. on the age of the car. <laughs> Great. We will leave. We can leave this out. Yeah. Happy to save paper. My scenario is actually happening. Uh, the GFC the free and reduced price food yeah. services. Ours is okay, yeah. but um, we met, and I think probably next time we'll have the updated ADF which deals with the with uh, more specific language. Um, EFD, the meal charge policy, I thought we used. Okay, and that brings E for me. Great. Any other thoughts? Additions or amendments? Yes, sir. Great. All right, that's all I've got for policy. We'll save, maybe since we have a jam-packed agenda, we save F for the first meeting in March and G for the second meeting in March. F and G would do. That might be a good idea. Please. I will also get this top sheet. Yeah. I'll share that with Michelle so that you yeah, have good. this for yeah, F and G, because that's. It's a shorter anyway. Yeah, actually, we could probably do it. I think F and, I think, yeah. We can probably do F and G together. I think F was like a 15 minute discussion. Okay. Um, right. So we're going to. We'll, but we'll do it at the beginning of March. Great. Although F right now, I would make a motion that we accept F as is. Do we want to vote on F? Do you want to? <laughs> Let's do it in March. Okay. We'll give Joyce and Eric a chance. You, right? you know what? I. Michelle got real excited that we <laughs> were going to vote on one. <laughs> you were like, we I can was in. <laughs> First. First. Well, yeah, we can do them both at the same time. All right, so I'm going to move on. Great. Um, item 11, other topics not uh, for discussion not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Does anyone have anything? I say no. OK, mm. good. Um, and then number 12, chairperson's notes. And number 13, communications, which I think is normally here. But I will take a volunteer to read tonight. All right, announcements for February 7th, 2023. Wednesday, February 8th, incoming kindergartner, kindergarten information presentation hosted by Page Hilltop Elementary will be five to six. 
Um, it will be virtual. Presumably a link has been shared on our website. Um, also, Wednesday, February 8th is a 90-minute early release for students and professional development for teachers. Lunch will be served. Dismissal time for the high school and middle school is 1250. Law and Page Hilltop is 145. Thursday, February 9th, half day of school for grades 6 through 8 and evening conferences. Students will be dismissed at 1120. Friday, February 10th, half day of school for grades 6 through 8 and afternoon conferences. Students will again be dismissed at 1120. Monday, February 13th, progress reports issued for students in grades preschool through five. Wednesday, February 15th, FY24 public budget hearing and school committee meeting. 6 p.m. in the middle school library. Just checking that time is 6 p.m. Great, it's 6.30 at the middle school library. Thursday, February 16th, incoming kindergarten information presentation hosted by Page Hilltop Elementary. That'll be at 10 to 11 a.m. It's virtual, see website for link. Thursday, February 16th, Little Panthers Integrated Preschool Team Annual Preschool Registration Information Session for the um, school year 23-24. Um, and that'll be 4 p.m. It will be virtual. See our website for the link. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm guessing there's no need for executive session, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I would make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we're adjourned at 8.59. Thanks, guys.